how can the private sector better engage with underrepresented communities, creating pipelines to employment, access to capital? How can the system help us catch up? Sure. I think it, it's more than just helping the community catch up. I think it is ensuring that America has a very strong economic base, which means making a more inclusive economy. You know, it's interesting, you know, as a employer of, a, you know, over 100,000 people globally, you know, I look at, you know, when you actualize people, what is the end result? You know, there's a consumptive dynamic. There is an enterprise dynamic of how do you actually, you know, excite people in a way that they're building more innovative products, they're more agile, they're taking, you know, in some cases mitigating risk in the businesses. So I would argue, you know, we always talk about it's the right thing to do. It Economically, it is, you know, from as a fiduciary, it is the only way you should approach your business. You should approach your business as a fiduciary to say, what are the things that minimize risk and optimize outcome? And there's tons of data, and I brought a couple of data points to share. You know, Deloitte did a, a, a report that six times organi organizations that are more uh, diverse in their workforce culture, six times more likely to be innovative and agile, eight times more likely to achieve better business results, and twice as likely to exceed their financial targets. You know, BCG had something similar where they talk about, you know, products that are developed with a diverse workforce have 19 percentage points higher growth hmm. than those who don't. You know, Gartner talks that uh, organizations have, uh, diverse organizations have 12% better employee performance. And McKinsey, and this is, you know, one of the things that I look at, if you look at what McKinsey says, you know, diverse organizations attract customers. And the African American and the Latinx population are saying that if you represent who they are, that's gonna increase spending annually by over 300 billion dollars wow. just in the U.S. So there's a consumptive dynamic that makes it, in my mind, a fiduciary duty to not only consider but embrace diverse workforces. There's also the wealth gap. Mm -hmm. And if we were to equalize the wealth gap right now, you know, white Americans are about 12 times more wealthy than African Americans. If you just equalize that, that's an additional $1.5 trillion annually that would be contributed to U.S. GDP. Wow. Okay, so... It's beyond the right thing to do mm -hmm. uh, from a moral perspective. It's the right actual thing to do from an economic perspective. And we, we keep losing that narrative, and that's one of the most important parts of the narrative. So diversity is good for business. Well, it is critical for businesses to survive and sustain, especially in a highly competitive global environment. If economies outside the U.S. decide to, again, actualize all of their citizens, mm -hmm and enable those citizens through access to broadband and you know, capital and enablement tools, they will then start to outstrip the U.S.'s capacity because we aren't actualizing all of our citizens. Hmm. And I think that's an important element of what we have to do as a group here at Concordia. We, of course, do it at Vista and mm -hmm. in, in, in uh, academic institutions, is how do you actualize more of the citizenry to participate in what is now a digital, a digital-centric economy? So it's an important part of what we do. But why has it taken the business world so long to figure this out? Or why are some <laughs> sectors resistant <laughs> to this? Uh, and you know this, you, you have written books on it. Uh, <laughs> well, it, I had to ask for the straight face. Yeah, of course, right. <laughs> and you did a good job of that. Okay. <laughs> uh, it, it, it is, you know, there, there are systemic barriers, uh, many of which have been, you know, constructed over hundreds of years and generations, some of which we've been able to deconstruct mm -hmm. and some of which are trying to recrystallize mm -hmm. uh, that we have to continue to fight against and fight, uh, and, and fight for progress in that regard. So to me, I think about some very simple economic pillars that, that we can actually solve uh, today that, that will create this enablement. One is broadband. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, we are absolutely moving increasingly into a more digital economy. 82% of HBCUs, which are you know, historically black colleges and universities, are in broadband deserts. Hmm. Okay, now when you think about 82%. this. 82%. 82%. And the vast majority of uh, African American engineers, vast majority of our doctors, the vast majority of our judges all come from HBCUs. But think about being and in that, college. And that, and that percentage is going to increase right. because of the, the Supreme Court's recent decision right. about affirmative action. And, and talking to the HBCU uh, college presidents over this last week, and I'm gonna meet more tomorrow, 
record, record uh, uh, now enrollment, first of all, and they've got some housing issues we're dealing with, but also, you know, applications. Right. So that dynamic is actually saying, okay, you're going to disable or, you know, a, a big part of the growing population in America by not giving them broadband access. And as you know, software is the most productive tool introducing our business economy in the last 50 years, will be for the next 50. And so we have to enable all of our citizenry to participate. So that's kind of point one. Mm -hmm. 70% of African-American communities don't have branch banks hmm. in their neighborhood. I grew up in a neighborhood where there were no banks, hmm. no branch. My parents who were both teachers, and you, you, as right. you know, had to drive across town to, to use a bank. Well, if you don't have a bank in your community, you don't have the ability to borrow money for a small business, to help you manage you know, <laughs> loans for your house, for mortgages, et cetera. And so, in America, the, the first, there's a couple ways, but the, the, what, the second wave of economic growth came from real estate. And mm -hmm. if you were in an area that was redlined, where they couldn't borrow money to actually create a mortgage, then those, those areas remained depressed. And so wealth couldn't be created mm -hmm. uh, if you couldn't gain access for real estate, real estate development. Those infrastructure pieces, broadband on the one hand, banking infrastructure on another, and most of our communities are still banked by what are called CDFIs, community you know, development uh, uh, financial institutions. If we have to digitize those and then drive capital into those infrastructure, because that's what creates economic activities and jobs and mobility, which creates a higher consumptive opportunity for all Americans and all of America to, to, to now participate in, so. Let me follow up on that in terms of the uh digital divide. No one has been more important to you or profit um, uh, of this, focusing on bridging the digital divide. Tell us why this is a critical issue for you, how you spotted it at the beginning and your organizations and the impact that it has on our broader economy. Now, you introduced it a little bit. Could you elaborate? Yeah, yeah. So, it, again, you know, I'm in the world of enterprise software. Our companies we operate in 180 countries, 70 different industries. We have over 440 million users of our software. Hmm. And so not surprisingly, you know, it, it becomes, you know, very clear who is consuming our products. I think we've got 1.5 million small to medium businesses. So we measure the impact of software on our customers. So we have you know, our 80 plus companies. We go out and we measure, okay, what's the return on investment of the products that we sell to our customers? Mm -hmm. Our average ROI is 640%. Hmm. Okay, this is products that we sell to banking, to insurance, to small to medium businesses, you name it. For the small to medium business segments, it's 900%. Hmm. But if you do not have broadband, and you are a small business owner, and there's no broadband in your community, so let's say you run you know, a barbershop or a restaurant or you know, insurance agency or whatever it might be, and you don't have broadband, you're not gonna get that 900% ROI. So, if you need things like scheduling software, accounting software, any of those sort of things, because if you don't have that access to the basic infrastructure, and I will argue today that enterprise software is basic infrastructure, if you don't have access to that, you are gonna be less and less competitive over time, which means you are gonna be able to hire fewer and fewer people. And small to medium businesses are the largest employers in the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's typically, as you know, where you grew up, West Virginia, mm -hmm. where your first job? What was your first job? It was typically you know, a business that was in your neighborhood that you could walk to. Well, if those sure. businesses aren't operating pro you know, efficiently, productively, then they can't hire the interns and the kids and then ultimately people who now you know, help expand their, their, their businesses. We discovered this during, well, not discovered, but you know, this was highlighted during COVID when we had the PPP program. Mm -hmm. And I worked with, you know, at the time with Secretary Mnuchin and, and you know, Senator Schumer and others. I said, listen, you know, these communities and the, the, the business in those communities are basically gonna, you know, gonna fail unless we get capital to them. Mm -hmm. And so the first act was, okay, great, we're gonna have a PPP plan. But you know, the, we found out the capillary banking system didn't actually have access or didn't have capital to push into those small businesses. Hmm. And there was one credit union. And why was that? Well, A, they didn't have digital capabilities. There's one credit union, for instance, Hope Credit Union, where they had, you know, and Bill Bannon, Bannon who runs this, he had, did, did 60 business loans, six zero business loans. This is in the Delta in Mississippi, kind of the year before that crisis. Once we digitized his bank, he did 1,500 loans a month. Gee. 
oh, by the way, the average loan was $11,000, okay? The average, you know, uh, size of company was, you know, five employees, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, and his, and his FDIC return rate uh, actually was, was higher than the FDIC you know, level. So they were re repaying the money faster, okay? And at a higher return rate than the FDIC. If you digitize the CDFIs and then push capital into them, so the first wave of PPP came, all the big banks sucked it up, then it went to the big customers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We then had to go back and carve capital out for that channel, which made a huge difference. And I, I know it saved tens of thousands of small to medium businesses uh, in those communities. And because I got letters and notes from people saying, hey, had we not done that, I would have gone out of business. But mm -hmm. you think about the ability to generate economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. In today's economy, it's digital, and it's capital, mm -hmm. and these communities are lacking both. Mm -hmm. So part of what we have to do as private citizens is bring our capability and frankly also our votes mm -hmm. to our, our you know, public representatives to say, we need to enable this to happen so our communities are stronger and it makes a stronger America. So what that's would, what we're focused on. What would it take, I mean, can you envision everybody everywhere having um, access to you know, just walk it down the street. You could just take it for granted. Right. That we are, can be online without a big deal. Right. Will that happen? Can it, it, it happen? There is no reason it shouldn't. You know, our friend Mukesh Ambani, mm -hmm. okay, many of you know in India, rolled out a system, Geo. Now they have one, it is the, the first digital country. 1.3 billion people have access to 4G. Just walking down the street. Right now. So if you go to India today and someone comes up to your window and wants to sell you a bottle of water, you pay them digitally. Wow. Okay? Think about that. Right? They use that time in COVID to build out a digital infrastructure which will give them a sustainable competitive advantage for generations. And you're telling me we can't do that for, you know, but you what, know, 70 HBCUs? So obviously we could we could do that. India just did it. Why, right. why are we doing it? Well, that's up to us to ensure that it happens and to ensure that our politicians and to ensure that, they, that frankly, the private sector is making a call. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I sit on the board of the Business Roundtable and one of the key issues that I hear every single day out of that organization and the companies as large as 240 companies in America is we don't have enough labor. We're sitting here today at three and a half percent unemployment, right. but yet we haven't built the infrastructure to actualize existing mm -hmm. U.S. citizens so that they can participate in the labor force mm -hmm. at scale. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. actualizing that will solve a lot of the labor issues and a lot of the problems and that we have today. Underemployment. Absolutely, underemployment. Right. Underemployment. And when you and you know this in our neighborhoods we grew up in, you know, when someone had a really good job, they supported five, six, eight, ten people. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we have to we have to regenerate that, you know, in the importance of educating and enabling these stu these these people to participate in the next generation of, of opportunity. Let's talk about <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Let's talk about the two percent solution. Yeah. Um, the idea that corporations, of course, as you all know, should invest two percent of their profits to support racial equity. You are also the chairman of Student Free Freedom Initiative. I have the pleasure of being on your board and a leader of Southern Communities Initiative, along with Dan Schulman, CEO of PayPal, and Rich Lesser, Global Chair of Boston Consulting. Student Freedom Initiative and Southern Communities Initiative are two organizations that use and direct those corporate funds to drive racial equity. Right. So for us, could you elaborate on how these organizations are working with corporate partners to invest that money into black and brown communities to help close, crucially, the wealth gap. Right, so again, the early part of Student Freedom Initiative was how do we ensure that the students who go to these HBCUs and MSIs aren't you know, overly burdened with debt. So mm -hmm. you know, what we've set up, of course, is a fund where they borrow, it's typically to offset the parent plus loans, which you know, the, the, the rates and terms of those, are, I think, are, are, are quite oppressive, uh, where they borrow money from this fund and they pay it back into the fund and it gets relent back right. out to the next generation. So again, elegant solution to a really complex problem. Paying it forward. Paying it forward. Mm -hmm. And then we said, well, we figured out, when, once as we were going through and said, you know, the broadband desert issue is a big issue for the HBCUs, where our students were coming from. 
And they're saying, well, this is great, but I don't have access to broadband. So we took that on as an initiative, which is part of what we're accomplishing. So now I think we've had you know, 15 town halls in across you know, six southern states, and which overlaps with our southern communities, where we're now able to, to address and put together plans so that each one of those HBCUs can now submit to get bead funding, which is the infrastructure bill funding that has passed. Hmm. We've got to get that done by the end of this year. And you know, corporations here want to help. You can just go to into the websites SFI or, or SEI. It's important that if we, you know, again, like as you know, in the GI Bill, one of the challenges with that, you know, 1.2 million African Americans came back um, from fighting in the war. You know, my grandparent being one of them. My father. Applied for the GI Bill, only 5% of them were able to use it for right. various reasons I won't go into. Right. And it gets distributed at the state level. So if you don't have the plans built, you can't apply. So we're working with each one of these HBCUs in Alabama and Mississippi and Tennessee and, and actually Ohio mm -hmm. uh, and, and a few other states to ensure, Louisiana, to ensure that they have the, the adequate planning functions done and the proposal so they can now get this funding. Because if we can build out that infrastructure, it's mm -hmm. going to be a massive enablement for you know the, this community of, of, of Americans to, to participate. So, so that's I, a critical element that we need to focus on. So my father, your grandfather, missed the opportunity to be part of the greatest economic boom in terms of the size of the middle class right. through the GI Bill right? because of discrimination. Right. right. So, you know, our you know, grandfather, your father went and said, okay, no, you can't go to college. You can go to this trade school. And by the way, the money went to the trade, to, to someone who managed the program, you know, right. their trade school. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they wanted to buy a house. Well, it's in a redlined area, so you can't buy that house. You can't put a loan on that house because there's no FDIC insurance on it. So they ended up renting as opposed to buying, which was, that was the major expansion in economic prosperity and wealth creation in America up till the digital age. That's right. And so now we're in the digital age. And being screwed. Right, and so now <laughs> we don't have the infrastructure for the digital age. So right. this is what we're focused on with, with SFI and SCI, because once you have that broadband capacity, you can drive dollars into the banking system, CDFIs, MDIs. Mm -hmm. You also can deliver telemedicine solutions, mm -hmm. right? You can also deliver information into those communities to how to build and run their businesses. We just opened another one with Grameen Foundation in Atlanta. And so we'll be able to deliver, the, the plan is about $1.3 billion in these six cities for small business startups, principally African-American and principally African-American women in, in that construct. So building the infrastructure was an important part of what we're doing with you know, SSI, F, F, uh, SFI and SEI, building the infrastructure so that $340 billion of corporate dollar pledged after the murder of George Floyd has a place to go that creates sustainable, long-lasting benefits yeah, to the community. Re repeat that. That was pledged. The key word in his sentence right. was pledged. How much of that has been actualized? Yeah, uh, very little from People what go, I'm saying. Huh? I didn't, yeah. I didn't say that. Yeah, so, I know, right? Well, it's kind of interesting. There's about 90% of it comes from a few corporations. So we're working directly with them and saying, okay, here are, I'll use the word, shovel ready projects that now create an enablement, a sustainable enablement in those communities as opposed to a one time episodic you know, transfer of, ca of, of capital. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure we create sustainable business infrastructure, economic infrastructure, and wealth generating capacity in those, in those communities. You know, I see we have one minute and 15 seconds. We could talk all day. I love talking to you. And I love and talking I, to you. And I learned a lot. Um, so I'm going to ask you two things and then you, answer, you, you dance your way through. All right. <laughs> one, one is, what is going to be the impact of the rollback of um, affirmative action? It, since a terrible day, in April 1968, yep. when Dr. King was assassinated, yep. the black middle class doubled, black upper middle class quadrupled, yet the wealth gap, as you said right. uh, twice, right. has remained. So one, um, what will the impact of the Supreme Court decision be? And finally, in closing, for all the other CEOs in this audience, what are the couple of things that they can go out and do today yeah. to help drive equitable inclusion. Yeah. And growth. So impact, uh, it's it, what part of what we have to do is inform corporations, their outside directors, inside directors, CEOs, human resources departments, that it shouldn't change what is the economic reality of a more diverse workforce, 
enables more profits and more, you know, call it shareholder value that can be created. So we have, to, and we're driving that information out. So that's kind of one of the most important mm -hmm. things. You don't have to do anything differently. You may have to change the words around it, right. but you can still you know, execute on your mission. And most of the CEOs I've talked to are saying, hey, I'm gonna continue executing on my mission, but they need to be informed on how. Second thing, what you can do, hire more interns. That's the first thing. We have a platform, Intern Excel. I think we've got 23,000 STEM students on it from HBCUs, uh, et cetera. State, you know, still continue to bring people into, into the workforce. And of course, you know, work with us to enable the broadband, you know, uh, infrastructure build out so that these colleges and these communities have access to what is going to be the next greatest wealth generating opportunity in America, which is leveraging digital infrastructure. So those are things to do. Robert Smith, thank you very much. Skip Gates, always a pleasure. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all. <laughs>